Hello everyone and welcome to a new video on my YouTube channel, Anton GF. My name is Anton Garcia Fernandez and as usual, I'm talking to you from Jackson in the state of Tennessee in the United States of America. And today I would like to talk about a book that I have read several times and to which I come back fairly often, especially when I am writing a blog post or an article about the art of crooning. It's a book that I have in my hands right here. I'm going to show it to you. It's called The Rise of the Crooners, and it was written by Michael Pitts and Frank Hoffman, published in 2002, about 17 years ago. Right there on the cover, you have that picture of Bing Crosby and the Boswell sisters, uh, taken uh, on station KHJ. And, of course, Bing Crosby and the Boswells were, were together not only on radio, but also on records. They made some fine records together in the 1930s. The Rise of the Crooners is the book we're going to be talking about today, and it's one of the best and also one of the few books about the art of crooning and about crooners, uh, and I think it's an indispensable read for anyone interested in uh, that 1920s and 1930s uh, musical trend. Uh, it's a, a trend of crooning, whose influence uh, was pervasive through the 1940s and uh, beyond in popular music. Uh, this book has a chapter, as you can see on the cover, and it has a chapter on um, each one of six pioneering crooners, and they are Gene Austin, Russ Colombo, Ben Crosby, Nick Lucas, Johnny Marvin, and Rudy Valley. Um, these uh, chapters about these, uh, these six pioneer and crooners uh, are lengthy biographical sketches and analysis of their careers. Uh, of course, perhaps the uh, least interesting is the one on Bing Crosby because so much has been written already about uh, Bing, but it is still, even that chapter is still a good introduction to the life and career of uh, Bing Crosby. So you can see also on the cover, um, Michael Pitts were assisted uh, and uh, Frank Hoffman were assisted by uh, Dick Carty and Jim Bedoyan, and there is an introduction by Ian Whitcomb. Uh, Ian Whitcomb um, is a singer and musician, a crooning enthusiast, um, and his chapter is a very interesting discussion on the origins of crooning and also its uh, social, historical, and technological uh, context. Uh, Whitcomb talks fairly often about the fact that uh, the appearance of crooning is closely tied to the invention of the microphone and also to the appearance of electrical recordings because this kind of singing, crooning, uh, would never have transferred very well to the uh, acoustic process of recording that uh, was the only one in existence before the mid-1920s. But of course, when electrical recordings finally came to be, uh, crooning um, actually became very popular, very prevalent, in part because of the fact that it could be recorded really well by using the new electrical process. Uh, Whitcomb also uh, traces the development uh, of recorded uh, American popular music through the late 19th century um, and the early uh, 20th century, uh, noting uh, how popular tastes change just as new developments in technology appear. So the developments uh, of technology also have to do with shaping the uh, popular uh, tastes uh, when it came to music. So if we have an acoustic recording process versus an electrical, a new electrical recording process, uh, different kinds of voices would be suited to one and to the other. Uh, so the acoustic era um, knew big stars such as Billy Murray and Henry Burr, uh, even Al Jolson, his uh, earliest recordings uh, were acoustic recordings. Uh, so the acoustic horn uh, needed uh, powerful voices. Uh, and so singers like Billy Murray and Henry Burr, uh, it's two prime examples of this, uh, made a career out of recording popular songs in sort of a workmanlike kind of fashion. Um, and... Um, 
of course, this would change when it came uh, to the electrical recordings that were introduced around 1924, 1925, because the new electrical process allowed for the appearance and popularization of a different kind of singing, a softer uh, kind of singing, that of the crooners. Um, capturing uh, softer sounds uh, that the acoustic horn could not capture. The new electrical recordings were able to capture those sounds. So that made uh, a change, uh, not just in the kind uh, of voices that could be recorded, but also in the popular tastes of the people that bought and listened to the records. Um, I think Whitcomb makes a very good point uh, on page 28 um, about this. Uh, he says, the conquest by condenser, vacuum, and amplifier revealed starkly that certain veteran voices were married for life to the old horn, the acoustic horn. No amount of play acting could endow them with the geniality and naturalness of a Smith, whispering Jack Smith, Gillum, Art Gillum, or Little, that's Little Jack Little, an electric Murray, Billy Murray, so an electric, an electric Billy Murray sounds like an acoustic Murray, except that now the band is plump and spread nicely around the room, while Murray is a rail-thin pixie trapped in a box. So, of course, uh, certain singers that were popular during the acoustic era were not able to transfer uh, that popularity to the uh, new uh, kind of recording, which was the electrical um, uh, recording. Not only recording or records um, uh, were important when it came to the appearance of crooning, but radio also became very important um, because the new medium of radio um, in the 1920s and 30s was perfect for, um, for, for crooning, or crooning was perfect for the radio. Um, and this is something that also uh, Whitcomb talks about uh, on uh, page uh, 15. Uh, right at the bottom it says, This ultra-simple performing style, that of crooners, was perfect for the ultra-simple type of song being developed for broadcasting needs. Radio executives informed Tim Pan Alley that a range of no more than five melody notes around the middle of the keyboard was most suitable for quality radiophonics. So it wasn't just the new electrical recordings, it was also the fact uh, that crooning was perfect for the new medium of radio, which became extremely popular in the um, uh, 1920s and 1930s. And so crooners like Art Gillum, like Little Jack Little, uh, like Whispering Jack Smith, we'll talk about them a little bit later on, uh, they began to develop their own on-air personalities uh, and were used to selling not just the songs that they sang, which they were selling as well, People could listen to them on the radio and then buy the records or buy the sheet music to play the songs that were popular themselves. Uh, but they could also sell other products. So they were salesmen of not just music, of not just song, but also of other uh, products. So there was a commercial viability as well to, uh, the, uh, to these uh, singers and to the art uh, of, of crooning. It's quite interesting that in uh, his introduction, Whitcomb doesn't talk very much or not as much about Bing Crosby or Russ Colombo or Rudy Valley because uh, even though he does talk about them, he is aware that there's going to be chapters devoted, whole chapters devoted to them later on. Um, but Whitcomb concentrates on some of the crooning pioneers, which are probably even uh, not as well known as um, you know Gene Austin or Rudy Valley or Bing Crosby or uh, Russ Colombo. Uh, I'm talking about uh, singers like Art Gillum, Whispering Jack Smith, and Little Jack Little. He actually spent some time talking about the careers and the importance of these uh, singers. For example, uh, there's Whispering Jack Smith, who was one of the uh, pioneering crooners. Uh, it was known as the Whispering Baritone uh, and appeared on uh, New York radio. Uh, he was, uh, as we have mentioned, a baritone, but he had to whisper. He had this whispering sound because of a gas attack 
during World War I, apparently. And uh, in fact, he was uh, born in the United States, but his parents were German um, immigrants. And uh, he, early on, he took to playing piano, and he developed a conversational singing style, perhaps because um, of that gas attack that uh, we uh, mentioned. Um, and he accompanied himself on the piano and sang really uh, softly. Not only uh, did he develop an on-air personality, but he was also good-looking. He was dapper. Um, and he began as a song demonstrator, as a song plugger. Uh, and his job was then to sell the songs, to demonstrate the songs for um, uh, possible buyers of the sheet music or or the records, um, and very soon became uh, successful on both radio and uh, records. Uh, this happened also to uh, Art Gillum, who uh, was not uh, from the New York City area, but he was born in St. Louis uh, and later gravitated to Chicago. Um, he was, just like um, Whispering Jack Smith, uh, a, a song plugger, uh, but he also understood blues, the blues, and barrel house piano. Um, he didn't just uh, broadcast from one specific radio station or one specific area like uh, Jack Smith did, but he um, actually, Art Gillum, um, began touring big and small town radio stations and singing over the airwaves uh, everywhere he went uh, and thereby selling um, his music and his records and also other uh, products along the way. His style was also conversational. He used to say that he really wasn't a very good piano player and definitely not a good singer, but I actually beg to differ. His conversational style is really uh, interesting. At least it, 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 it sounds very interesting to me. It's uh, very enjoyable. And he was also very humorous. He was taking to uh, speaking during instrumental breaks, um, and he also used many outstanding uh, jazz musicians on many of his recording sessions. I'm talking about uh, musicians like Benny Goodman, for example, or Andy Sanella. Uh, I think even the Dorsey brothers at some point um, he was known, Art Gillum, as the uh, whispering pianist, uh, and he was popular on radio and records as well. Um, and at some point even had a little bit of a feud with whispering Jack Smith because they were recording for different labels, uh, rival labels. Um, and uh, it was uh, very common for Art Gillum to record a song, like for example, uh, one of his biggest hits was called Cecilia. Does your mother know you're out, Cecilia? <laughs> well, uh, Whispering Jack Smith would also record the same song and um, put it out, you know, within days of each other, and so in that way they were competing. But of course, both of them were fairly uh, popular. Uh, Whispering Jack Smith was a lot more popular with the city folks and also with people outside of the United States. In Europe, he was very popular. Uh, Prince of Wales in England loved his music and his personality. Mm, whereas Art Gillum was mm, more of a big hit on, um, in, 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 in more rural areas in the South and, and, and also uh, in, in smaller towns. Then we also have, and Whitcomb talks about uh, a third um, a uh, pioneer and crooner by the name of Little Jack Little, who was born in England, but uh, moved to Chicago and became really popular on radio in the Midwest. Uh, he was known as the friendly voice of the cornfields. Uh, um, when he was broadcasting all over the, uh, the Midwest, uh, and his radio presentations, his radio shows, and you can hear this on his records as well, um, he used catchphrases to distinguish himself himself from other uh, singers at the time. So he would start a song by saying, here it is, or he would finish um, either a song or the radio show by saying something like, yours very truly, Little Jack Little. And he also had a fairly conversational style. He was a nice piano player um, and became quite popular uh, as well. I don't think he was as popular as uh, Gillum or uh, Whispering Jack Smith, but he's he was another... Uh, crooning force to be reckoned with in those early years of um, 
crooning before uh, Bing Crosby, uh, Russ Colombo, uh, Rudy Valley came along and, 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 and would change this uh, kind of singing perhaps forever. Uh, Whitcomb talks also about other singers like Cliff Edwards, Ukulele Ike, or Sa uh, Sam Coslow, who is also a very good uh, songwriter in his own right. Uh, but he concentrates on these three, on Smith, Gillum, and Little, um, because their popularity was really widespread, but didn't really last too long. The appearance of radio uh, would bring about the standardization uh, of um, uh, crooning and this new art of singing uh, during the, uh, uh, the Depression, uh, particularly. Um, Whitcomb talks about 1929 as uh, the peak year of crooning, but crooning became standardized with the, appear the appearance of Rudy Valley, Bing Crosby, and Russ Colombo uh, in, in particular. Now, if we turn to page 20, um, uh, Whitcomb, um, I believe it's, it's page 20. Yeah, there we go. Page 20. Um, Whitcomb says, eccentric and often comic, our trio of pioneer crooners, so Smith, Gillum, and Little, was able to romp free for only a few years. As the electronic media of radio and records grew mightier, so the inevitable standardization set in. By 1929, the first wave of crooners had been swept aside on the airwaves by the sudden rise of Rudy Valley, an authentic Ivy League gentleman with a voice exuding sex appeal, a quality noticeably lacking in Smith, Gillum, and Little. And that's true. Smith, um, Gillum, and Little were uh, dapper. Sometimes they were quirky. Sometimes they were humorous. But um, they didn't have as much sex appeal as a Bing Crosby or even as a Rudy Valley. Definitely um, as a uh, Russ Colombo. Um, but, of course, the impact of of, of Crooning, even though 1929 is marked by uh, Whitcomb as the peak year, uh, the impact of crooning would last for decades, uh, especially due to Colombo, to Valley, and particularly Bing Crosby. Without Bing Crosby, there wouldn't be a Frank Sinatra, for example. And if you think about the uh, huge influence that uh, Bing Crosby and this early uh, crooners uh, had on big band singers, for example, uh, well, it was it was it was really a very uh, important influence. So even though 1929 is marked as the peak year by Whitcomb, we need to remember that this kind of uh, singing would um, remain influential for several decades. Um, it's interesting also that during the Depression, the uh, moral authorities uh, criticized crooners very harshly as a threat to the youth uh, in, in, in many ways. And there's a quote here on page 21 from uh, Cardinal O'Connell, um, uh, who, who says uh, the following about crooning and crooners. Uh, crooning is a degenerate form of singing, says Cardinal O'Connell. No true American would practice this base art. I cannot turn the dial without getting these whiners and bleeders defiling the air and crying vapid words to impossible tunes. And also, the New York Singing Teachers Association uh, said at the time, crooning corrupts the minds and ideals of the younger generation. So what would later be said about um, Elvis Presley and the Rockers in the 1950s, uh, about the Beatles in the 1960s, and so on and so forth, was already happening to the crooners in the uh, mid to late 1920s. Uh, some things obviously never change when something is new and different. Um, it actually mm, gets attacked, uh, it gets harshly criticized by the uh, establishment, by the moral authorities of the time, whatever time that uh, may be. Uh, later, the crooners were even criticized for not conforming to the ideal of masculinity uh, for sounding emasculated with uh, their high-pitched voices and their soft crooning, uh, all their pleading um, that they do in a lot of the songs like Just One More Chance, for example, or I Apologize, and, and, and many others. Um, of course, this would change somewhat with the arrival of 
baritones like Bing Crosby and Russ Colombo, um, who would be very influential and who did exploit their sex appeal. Um, uh, Colombo, because he was a uh, very handsome uh, man, and Crosby because of the uh, interest that he always had and the influence that he always uh, got from his interest in jazz. And so um, this would change. Rudy Valley was criticized a lot for this. Um, not so much Colombo and definitely not so much Crosby, but that's another side uh, to uh, crooning that um, created cer certain uh, discomfort in uh, some of the moral authorities in the United States at the, uh, uh, during the late 1920s and early uh, 1930s. All of this is really well explained by uh, Whitcomb in this uh, introduction to the book. Um, and he also even talks about his encounters with veteran crooners, which took place in the 1970s. Uh, he actually spent some time with Rudy Valley, with Nick Lucas, uh, with whom he actually played. Um, and also uh, with Sam Coslow. Uh, this, I think, adds even more of a personal, uh, personal dimension to the uh, introduction, which, um, in my opinion, is a very good introduction to the art of crooner, uh, crooning, an essential read if we want to understand where crooning came from, how it developed, why it appeared, um, and, 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 and many other things. Um, towards the end of the introduction, on page 43, um, Whitcomb actually um, asks a few rhetorical questions about crooning. He says, is crooning an art in the aesthetic sense? Can it be a thing of beauty with universal appeal and significance? Can it be transcendental? All I know is that I keep coming back to the singers and songs of this tradition whenever I'm caught in a wave of happiness or sadness. So, in my opinion, the answer to those, uh, I think, fairly rhetorical questions is for sure yes. Uh, it is uh, an art in the uh, aesthetic sense, and one art that actually would become extremely influential. The influence of these early crooners is to be felt, as I said before, um, uh, in the 1940s, in the 1950s, in the 1960s, if you think of songs that uh, Elvis Presley recorded, for example, uh, in the 50s and 60s, the ballads particularly, um, they are clearly influenced by the uh, early crooners, um, uh, particularly uh, Bing Crosby. Uh, and of course, you know, a lot of the big band singers, uh, most of them, even Frank Sinatra, when he started out as a um, uh, vocalist with uh, first Harry James and then uh, uh, Tommy Dorsey, uh, he was clearly influ influenced by uh, this crooning style, by Bing Crosby and others, and uh, this influence is to be felt on most of the uh, big band singers of the 30s and 40s and uh, uh, beyond. Um, turning to the actual book, uh, I'm not going to uh, talk about each one of the chapters uh, because mm, my intention is to make videos um, in the um, Say Don't You Remember series of uh, videos and podcasts that I have begun on the channel. My, my uh, intention is to do mm, videos for each one of uh, these uh, singers, particularly Gene Austin, Russ Colombo, Nick Lucas, Johnny Marvin, and also Rudy Valley. I may not do one on Crosby because mm, there's quite a bit of content about Crosby on the channel already. So I'm not going to talk about each one of these chapters uh, that Michael Pitts and Frank Hoffman wrote with the assistance of Dick Carty and Jim Bedoyan. Um, but I will tell you that the, the six of them are thoroughly researched and really well written, very, very readable, uh, with a wealth of information about the life and careers of uh, these six artists to such an extent that they put each career in uh, perspective, uh, placing each singer uh, within his historical context. Um, the, the chapters also uh, discuss each singer's multimedia impact, uh, the impact they had on radio, on film, on records, even on television. 
and also uh, each artist's influence on future artists. As I said, uh, a lot of these artists, all of these artists would be influential in one way or another uh, in several generations of singers that came after. Uh, the book also includes some tables. Uh, for example, at the end of the chapter uh, on Gene Austin, um, there is um, uh, a table uh, that details the songs that were written uh, by uh, Gene Austin and also the songs that were published by uh, Gene Austin. Very interesting as well is the fact that we have uh, at the end of the book, a discography, a filmography, and a bibliography for each one of the six artists. So if we want to uh, look up the records, uh, if we want to read more about them, even though in, in, in many cases there's really not a lot of information uh, about these uh, artists on other books uh, out there. But, you know, there is bibliography as well. The CD discography, of course, is a little bit outdated because the book came out in 2002. And so, obviously, uh, there have been CDs published, several CDs in some cases published between then and the present time. Uh, so, yes, the uh, CD discography might be a little bit outdated, but uh, it's still a valuable discography, and for sure um, the bibliography will you know, give us the chance to look uh, at other possible articles or books that might be uh, interesting if we are interested in any of these um, uh, singers. Uh, all in all, I find uh, The Rise of the Crooners, which I have right here in my hand again, I find it uh, a very valuable book about the appearance, about the popularization of crooning. It is engaging, it is easy to read, and also works very well as a reference book on the subject of crooning and crooners. Uh, to me, if you are interested in these uh, singers from the 1920s and 30s and beyond, uh, I recommend that you look this book up, that you try to find a copy and that you read it, uh, because it is essential reading, in my opinion. And it's also a very good place to start learning about the subject of crooning and also about the six artists that are profiled uh, uh, here, particularly because, as I have said, there is not a lot of bibliography um, available on some of the singers, uh, particularly, you know, uh, Nick Lucas, Johnny Marvin, even Gene Austin, there's not a lot of bibliography about them, so this is a really good place to start learning about crooning, learning about um, these six pioneering artists in this, in this field. So for this, we should be very thankful to Michael Pitts, Frank Hoffman, the authors of this book, with the assistance of Dick Carty and Jim Bedoyan. Also a very nice introduction by uh, Ian Whitcomb. I spent most of the video talking about that introduction because I wanted to give you an idea of where uh, crooning came from and the social and historical context that um, created or um, allowed for the appearance of this kind of music that is um, personally very interesting to me, very close to my heart. Uh, as you may know, uh, if you've seen other uh, videos on the channel or if you've listened to any other uh, of my podcasts here on the YouTube channel, Anton GF. The book is The Rise of the Crooners, Gene Austin, Russ Colombo, Bing Crosby, Nick Lucas, Johnny Marvin, and Rudy Valley, and was published in 2002 by Scare Crow Press. Seek it out, read it, and if you've read it already, or if you're interested in it, uh, you can always leave some comments underneath this video, and uh, I'll be happy to read them and answer them if um, if need be. Thank you so much again for uh, being here, for uh, watching, and um, it's time for me to say goodbye now. I hope you found this um, um, video interesting. The video was recorded live in Jackson in the state of Tennessee in the United States of America. Mine is the copyright. Uh, my name is Anton Garcia Fernandez, and the year is 2019. Thanks again, and so long, everybody.